We recently did some research on the Carian preceptors in order to tell you their story, and during that research, we looked extensively into Preceptor Celibus, the vassal of Rani with ambitions of his own. Celibus is known for his schemes, but also for his obsession with puppetry, an ancient art of bending the will of others to your own by encasing their souls within puppets. We have always been well aware of the popular theory regarding his relationship to the Karian servant Pitya, but we wanted to explore this a little more deeply by looking into what we know of Celibus and the man he was before we made our way to the Lands Between. Today we will be taking a closer look at both Celibus and Pitya, two men who have deep personal connections to the art of puppetry. Also, I personally am very excited for Liza P, so why not talk about puppets? Welcome to Elden Lore, Square Table Gaming series dedicated to exploring the characters and enemies of Elden Ring, delving into their stories and providing our best theories on their lore. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. Thank you for choosing to spend some time with us today. If you end up liking this video, we ask that you please consider subscribing. Every subscription goes a long way in building this incredible community, and we sincerely appreciate it. You can also feel free to check out our Discord if you want to delve deeper into Elden Ring's story with other FromSoft fans. Whether you subscribe or not, thanks again for checking out our content. And with that said, let's get back to the topic at hand. We'll start our exploration with the story of Celibus, the Karian Preceptor. While we know he acts as a vassal to Rani, he has surprising connections to the Round Table Hold. It seems Celibus and Gideon once worked together in some capacity. It's after we receive the Puppet of Dolores, the Sleeping Arrow, that we learn of their history. One of Celibus' favorite puppets, used to summon the spirit of Dolores, the Sleeping Arrow, spirit of a handsome archer who dressed in the style of a man. Called the Silent Hunter by some, she fires St. Trina's arrows from her short bow. Dolores once belonged to the Round Table Hold, where she was both a critic and friend of Gideon the All-Knowing. It was because of her that he and Celibus went their separate ways. We know Celibus has a poor opinion of Tarnished in general, but at some point he was willing to work with the All-Knowing, at least until Dolores caught his eye and she became one of his most prized puppets, effectively ruining their working relationship. This would not be the first time Celibus seeks to take someone away from Gideon, but we'll get to that soon. Upon meeting Celibus for the first time in Ronnie's Rise, he makes it clear he does not think we belong in her service, nor does he want to have anything to do with us, but in service to his lady, he does offer a face-to-face -face meeting at his rise. We can make our way there, and he says, Well, well, you took me at my word. Did you not realize I was merely being polite? Oh, you provincials never cease to amaze. Uh, I suppose you're here now. Perhaps I'll give you something to do. I'd like you to find a woman called Nefeli to administer a potion. Even you can do that much, can't you? Good, good. Now I shall hand over the potion in question. Find Nefeli and ensure she drinks it. I expect glad tidings, and soon. We then have a choice to give the potion to Nefeli, give it to Gideon, or save it for the Dung Eater. Regardless of your decision, you can tell Celibus you gave it to Nefeli, and he will say, ah, So you made Nefeli drink the potion? Well done! You are a touch more useful than I had thought. Very well. Then you shall have your gift. Knowledge of the sorceress arts and of the tutelage of the great preceptor Celavis. I doubt much of it will lay within the grasp of a mere tarnished, but if you put your mind to it, perhaps you won't embarrass our lady. You wish to begin right this moment? Well, your impatience, though boorish, is understandable. Let's have at it. From here, Celibus will teach you various sorceries. Up to this point, 
Celavus has not mentioned his proclivity toward puppets, but after we find his secret hideaway, filled to the brim with various puppets, he says, You break into a man's private chambers, rooting about as you please. Your offishness knows no bounds. Fine and well, you tricked Nefeli and had her drink the potion. I believe that makes you my accomplice. You yearn for a puppet of your own, hmm? Well, normally one of your stature would never be allowed. But perhaps I can make a very special exception. Now, choose. Interestingly, Celavis will not discuss puppets with us again until we make a trip to another servant of the Carian royal family, Pidia. I tested this while going through his questline multiple times, as I could not find anyone else making this distinction. But speaking with Celavis about puppets again would not trigger for me until after meeting Pidia. Upon meeting him for the first time, he acts as if he knows us, saying, You? I, uh, sorry, your worship. I apologize for any offense given. I am Pidia, servant to the Carian royal family. I am charged with maintaining these ghastly dolls. By acting surprised when he says, you, it implies Pidia already knows who we are. But how could he upon our first meeting? We can speak with him again, and he's still overly formal with us. Your worship, allow me to be of use. Other than the puppets, there are some very fine things up here in this storeroom. Why not pick something out before you go? But please, can you offer poor ill-starred Pidia a little something by way of compensation? During our interactions with him, he calls the dolls ghastly, implying he's not a fan of working with them but this seems to be a ruse. After meeting with Pidia, we can speak with Celavus again, and there's a new option. I want a new puppet. When we choose this, Celavus says, What's that? You want another puppet? Quite the keen paramour, aren't we? But I'm afraid each and every one is like a child to me. I can hardly just give them away. Oh dear, what's to be done? Why don't you fetch me some starlight shards? If you can manage it, I'll gladly prepare a new puppet for you. The soul of every puppet has its own ambience. You'll soon come to know once you possess a few. And once each's predilections are known to you, the better you'll be able to love them. Oh yes. You have much to look forward to further down this road. You're proving to be quite the puppeteer. I've not had an apprentice for a very long time indeed. He seems to have warmed up to us, and will even let us in on a scheme he's been brewing. Perhaps so you'll be interested in a little scheme of mine. It will produce the finest of puppets, which I aspire to cherish with these very hands, a ploy to fool even Lady Rani. How does that sound? Ah, I knew I had you pegged. You're just like me. Then I'd like you to procure something, a rather unique starlight shard that glistens with amber. With that, my special draft will gleam with nectar sweetness. And even a demigod would be slave to its charms. What demigod he has in mind should be obvious, but Celavus is not yet ready to share the truth of his plan yet, even when we procure what he needs. Well, well. You managed to lay your hands on it. The blessed day is finally upon us. Goodness gracious, the way it glistens. Utterly enchanting. To think this was once a demigod's very fate. My, oh my, oh my. Ah. 
Ah. Are you still here? Ah, oh, yes, I, I should give you your reward. Yeah, please. It's all yours. It's splendid work. It's just marvelous. Now, just you wait. The merriment is soon to begin. The scheme I promised is to be revealed very shortly. Once his drought is complete, Celevis finally lets us in on his true plan. I've been waiting for you. It's finally complete. The perfection of my draft, gleaming nectar sweet. Give it to Rani and ensure she drinks it. The dead-eyed doll lets down her guard in your presence rather remarkably. Though she might dip her hands in the dirt and feign that icy persona, She's a frail, gentle girl at heart. You understand, don't you? That once you have Rani drink my draft, my scheme will come to fruition. And we... Well... We'll be in a position to claim the very finest puppet ever crafted. Just imagine the... Celevis' goal has always been to take Lady Ronnie for himself, and he expects us to help him do it. We then have the option of betraying our lady or giving her the Finger Slayer Blade. If we choose to give her the potion, she seems unsurprised at Celevis' betrayal, but takes yours to heart. Should we simply give her the blade she seeks, we're able to continue pursuing her questline. Either way, an interesting thing happens when we go to visit Celevis. After walking into his tower, we see him on the ground, unresponsive to us, presumably dead. But something is off. Celevis does not lie on the ground or show a puddle of blood beneath him, nor does his body fade away like many of our other compatriots who die. He's on his knees, in the same position as all of the puppets found within his secret lair. This heavily implies that Celevis himself was a puppet. There is no other explanation for why this specific animation would be used for his death, as it is only repeated for puppets. This begs the question, if Celevis was a puppet, who was pulling the strings? After finding Celevis dead, we can return to Pitya, and what we see is drastically different from what we'd expect from this mild-mannered servant. Pitya will say, uh, Stop, please, stop. Pitya, my puppet, I loved you with all I have. How could you forget such bliss? Ah, let her Please, I beg you, cease this cruelty. Pitya will be lying dead at their feet and will drop either the Dolores puppet or, if we gave her the potion, the puppet of Nefeli Lu. His line about loving the puppet stands in stark contrast to his previous comments, calling them ghastly, and knowing how deeply Celevis wanted Nefeli for himself, and the fact that Dolores was one of his favorite puppets. It strongly implies that Pitya was the one pulling Celevis' strings this whole time. The Celevis we know is likely nothing more than the puppet of a man who once worked with Gideon Ofnir, or perhaps Celevis himself was never real at all simply a way for Pitya to move across the land, even though he had no legs of his own. This is why Pitya seems to know us upon our first meeting. He's already met us as Celibus. To further this theory, the Elden Ring Books of Knowledge Volume 1 even discusses Celibus' fate in his character bio in a very interesting way. 
Ronnie isn't one to fall for the schemes of two-bit traitors. If you attempt to help Celibus, she will catch you red-handed and immediately dismiss you from her service. You'll then find Pitya dead and Celibus in an unresponsive heap on the floor of his tower. The book specifically calls out Pitya's death in Celibus's bio, while not referring to Celibus as dead, but unresponsive. Given that this book is officially produced material, we believe this is solid evidence that Preceptor Celibus, the powerful mage and puppet master, is nothing more than Pitya's puppet. The story of Celibus the Preceptor may have ended long ago, or it may have been a fabrication from the very beginning. Because it turns out, the story we've been following all along has been that of Pitya, the Karian servant. This unassuming Albanarch has been the puppet master behind the scenes, pulling Celibus's strings and serving Lady Rani so that he could one day get close enough to make her his puppet. What we believe is most interesting about this is that it seems Rani may have been truly fooled by him this entire time. She does not claim we were led astray by Pitya's plots, but Celibus's. In fact, she never seems to acknowledge Pitya in any way meaning he likely managed to stay off her radar until his betrayal. We speculate that once Ronnie tried to punish Celibus for his betrayal, she was met with nothing more than a puppet, causing her to turn the remaining puppets against their true master, Pitya. That is what we see when we visit him for the final time. Ronnie now controls his puppets, and through either her will or their own, they get their revenge on the master who made them nothing more than playthings for his own sick satisfaction. What do you think of the story of Celibus and Pitya? Do you doubt that Celibus was a puppet all along? And if so, how do you explain his ultimate fate, slumped over in the same unresponsive pile as his puppets? Was Pitya truly pulling the strings all along, or was he simply a servant, leeching off of his master's stash of puppets? If you believe Celibus was a puppet, when do you believe he was turned? Or has he been one all along? Let us know your thoughts and theories in the comments. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell so you never miss out on any of our lore dives. We look forward to seeing you again for more Elden Lore.